Hi everybody, Jimmy DeYoung. Welcome to Prophecy Today video. Today's focus on the broadcast will be on Jerusalem. You know, the Bible has a past, present, and prophetic significance for the city of Jerusalem. We'll get to that in just a moment. But first, a quick look at other geopolitical activities, current events that are setting the stage for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. This last week, Russian President Medvedev had an opportunity to visit in the Middle East. He went in to meet with the leadership of Turkey, also into Syria. And this is very interesting, promising Turkey and Tayyip Erdogan, a man who wants to be the pan-Islamic leader of the world, he is going to be receiving from the Russian technology and technicians a capability of establishing a nuclear power plant. I wonder if that's all he has in mind. In addition to that, Medvedev promised President Assad of Syria a capability of military armament being delivered to them, even some of the aircraft that they may need to deliver a strike on Israel itself. Bob, talk to us about this. What's going on in the Middle East as it relates to Russia? It's really about uh, selling their technology what they do best, and that is build nuclear reactors on the cheap and, of course, sell weapons, which a lot of the new weapons that the Chinese have in their ships, their submarines, are made in Russia. Uh, so Medvedev is certainly in Turkey trying to do his bidding with a nuclear reactor. It looks like they're going to have several. And then, of course, they're toying with the idea of giving one to Syria, which uh, no doubt has raised the cackles in Israel. Bob McGinnis from Washington, D.C. This week, also new leadership in Great Britain. And, of course, the Greek economic crisis continues to cause all kinds of problems. The euro is weakening. Many people talking about it's gone. The European Union will be gone. My question for Rob is, in all of these issues that we think about when we focus on the European Union, is this going to weaken the European Union or strengthen it, Rob? I believe it will, and, and there's really a couple of reasons. The prime reason is they're going to demand more rules and more control of the individual countries' budgets, and the one who controls the money is always the power that, that be. So the EU is really going to take advantage of this crisis. I think they'll clamp down further on how the various nations can spend their money. Once they've done that, the nations are giving up sovereignty again. And, and, and never forget that the EU is the power in Europe. The rest of the countries can do, it's like our states, they have their own region of power, but the overall still is the EU. There's too much money in the EU. There are three, if you will, capital cities of the EU filled with workers. Uh, the EU is not done. They've gone through a difficult time. They will continue to go through a difficult time, but they are not easily going to give up the EU. All that taken into consideration, Rob, let me ask this very direct question. With what is happening in the European Union, is this still setting the stage for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled? If you study your Bible and look at the tribulation period and the finances, you see that we well are on a road that is leading to what is described in the Bible in that period of time called the tribulation, the time when the church will be gone, but the world will still be carrying on. So I, I still see the path moving in that direction. Dr. Rob Congdon, a man who focuses on the European Union for us as we watch it setting the stage for Bible prophecy, as he said, to be fulfilled. Now to our focus on Jerusalem. Winky Madad talked with me this last week saying that Jerusalem has a political aspect, but a biblical aspect as well. Is that right, Winky? Absolutely, uh, Jimmy. Um, Jerusalem has been with the Jewish people ever since Abraham was commanded to take his only son Isaac, and in a test of faith, and uh, the identification of where the altar where Isaac was bound up was Moriah, or Moriah in English, and that is, of course, the hill on which the Temple Mount stands, uh, where the first and the second temples were, uh, and what you see today with the Mosque Waqf uh, enclave, uh, and uh, that has ever since the conquest of the city by David, uh, later on it became the capital of the tribal federation after actually Shiloh 
uh, transferred from north of the city to uh, Jerusalem, and has been our capital ever since. And when we say capital, Jimmy, it's, uh, as you know, and I hope most of the listeners do, I mean, at the end of the Passover festival meal, the Seder, we say next year in Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the uh, when a wedding is made in Jewish custom, a glass is broken in memory of Jerusalem. Uh, everything uh, that revolves around our culture, our religion, and our identity has some sort of connection to Jerusalem. You, you take Jerusalem out uh, of, of Judaism or the Jew, and it just fades away. We we don't have multiple holy sites. The only sanctified place in the Jewish religion is the uh, is the Temple Mount. So uh, this is the ultimate in terms of realization of um, man on earth in in reaching towards a a commune with heaven, and the point where these two touch are Jerusalem. Wow, what an interesting statement. The connection point between heaven and earth, the city of Jerusalem. Well, Jerusalem is sacred to the Jewish people. Gabby Barkai is a renowned archaeologist. He is the recipient of the Jerusalem Prize on Archaeology, a professor at Berylon University, and has a special project of reclaiming the artifacts that were thrown into the city dump taken off of the Temple Mount with 400 trunkloads of the materials that the Palestinians dug out of the ground, not with archaeological tools, but with big machinery. Talk to us about uh, this project you're involved with, Gabby. Actually, this is a uh, a kind of an attempt to uh, make something positive out of a very uh, destructive and barbaric act which was taken by the Islamic Waqf when they uh, illicitly uh, dug with heavy machinery a gigantic pit on the southern part of the Temple Mount about 11 years ago. We have tens of thousands of finds. Uh, Just to give you one small example, we have 6,500 coins, ancient coins, which uh, give us a very... uh, interesting view of the history of the Temple Mount. We have, uh, I think, the largest collection ever of uh, Crusader coins that was ever discovered. Uh, We have two coins of the Yehud type, which are of the earliest coins ever minted in Jerusalem. That is in the 4th century B.C. That is uh, uh, around 2,300 years ago something which is uh, unbelievable. We have uh, coins of the Herodian dynasty, uh, time of Jesus. We have the coins of the uh, time of the uh, Hasmonean dynasty. We have Roman, uh, Byzantine, early Arabic, and uh, medieval coins of all kinds and types. Gabby Barkai, very excited about his project working with the reclamation of these artifacts that were thrown in the dump. Gabby, did you do this in order to prove that there was a Jewish presence on the Temple Mount? Listen, we do not try to prove anything. The Jewish presence upon the Temple Mount uh, is well known. Uh, You don't need us for that. Uh, That is well written in uh, all the... uh, Um, ancient historical writings as well as in the scriptures. So I do not try to prove anything. We just try to see whatever we can save from uh, the tragic uh, acts that took place upon the Temple Mount. Dr. Gabby Barkai, a very special friend to us here on Prophecy Today. Gabby saying that he was not endeavoring to prove that the Jews had been on the Temple Mount. He doesn't have to do that with artifacts, archaeological remains. The Bible says so. Let's check it out and see if that is correct. 2 Samuel chapter 5 talks about King David, the second king of Israel, who established Jerusalem, the Jebusite stronghold, at the time when he became king of all 12 tribes of Israel the Jewish people. He went into Jerusalem, captured this Jebusite stronghold. He made it the capital, the political capital of the Jewish people. Now that was 3,000 years ago. That's 2 Samuel chapter 5. Read that entire chapter. Chapter 6 of 2 Samuel talks about King David going down to Kiryat Yarim, where the location of the Ark of the Covenant was. There he tried to one time bring the Ark of the Covenant up, 
to Jerusalem. He did not do it properly, had to read the manual, and all else fails, read the manual. So he went back to Kiryat Jarim, about 15 miles to the west of Jerusalem. He had the Levites lift the Ark of the Covenant. They brought it into Jerusalem, placed it in a tabernacle, and King David then made Jerusalem the spiritual capital of the Jewish people. You might recall that King David wanted to build the temple, a permanent worship center on the Temple Mount. He was not allowed to do that because of his sin, but God made him a promise. It's called the Davidic Covenant, and that's 2 Samuel chapter 7, where God said that one of his sons would build a temple on the Temple Mount. In fact, Solomon was the one responsible for the first installment of the Davidic Covenant being fulfilled. He did build that temple after his father, King David, passed from the scene. David had prepared for the building of the temple. He gathered all the manpower, the monies, the materials to build the temple. And actually then King Solomon did build the temple right there on the Temple Mount, brought the Ark of the Covenant into the Holy of Holies, and thus established a permanent worship center for the Jewish people in Jerusalem. That temple would be destroyed. Another temple would be destroyed in 70 AD, uh, but there is to be another temple on the Temple Mount, and that temple will be there because of the Davidic Covenant. Jeremiah in chapter 33 said the only way that he could fail to keep that Davidic Covenant, to make certain all of his promises to King David were fulfilled, was if the sun, the moon, and the stars had disappeared. Check outside, my friend, the sun, the moon, and the stars, they're still up and operating. Jerusalem in the past was established as the political capital of the Jewish people. The spiritual capital of the Jewish people. That's 2 Samuel chapters 5 and 6. It will have an eternal existence, and it will be for the Jewish people, 2 Samuel chapter 7. But before all of this does come about, before these things are fulfilled, Jerusalem is going to be the center of controversy. The prophet Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 2 says it will become a cup of trembling. People who control Jerusalem will be intoxicated with power before Jesus comes back and builds his temple there. Zechariah chapter 6 and verse 12, and rules and reigns from that spot forever and ever. Of course, that will be at the end of the tribulation period, which is right after the next event on God's calendar of activities. You see, it goes like this. The rapture takes place, the seven-year tribulation period, the return of Christ, he builds the temple, millennial kingdom, and then the great white throne judgment and into eternity future. That's the end-time scenario found in Bible prophecy. But the very next event, you hear what I said just a moment ago, the very next event is the rapture of the church. Jesus shouts, archangel shouts, trumpet God sounds, we're taken out of here. With everything focused on the city of Jerusalem, that rapture is about to happen at any moment. And having said that, basically nothing left for me to say, except let's keep looking up until...